Okay, great, thanks. Um, so happy to be here. Great conference. Um, so I want to talk about, um, so the theme I know is mapping class groups, and we'll get to that. So I want to talk about quality class and hierarchical hyperbolic spaces, which is sort of the, um, well, as you'll see, it's sort of a generalization of mapping class groups. And so we'll have the theorems about mapping class groups. Um, but I'll start, I'll start at the beginning. So let me, um, let me first say, this is all joined with Mark Hagen. Uh, and Alessandro Sisto. Okay, so now that I've said everything is joined with them, let me put up a theorem that is not due to any of us. Um, so our, our kind of our, our sort of guiding theorem is going to be the following result. So this is a result of Eskin Farr and proved independently by Kleiner and Lieb. Sort of what it's what inspires uh, the results that you want to build to. So their their result says uh, let X be a symmetric space of non-compact type type of rank uh, n greater than or equal to two. So you've got some uh, some non-rank one symmetric space, high rank symmetric space, um, and let uh, let phi be a map from uh, Rn, so this, from the rank, into your space via quasi-isometric embedding. Quasi-asymmetric embedding of Rn into the space is called a quasi-flat, and so the question is, what's the structure of quasi-flats look like in in, uh, in symmetric spaces? And, and it's answered by the following by the following conclusion: uh, then there exists a constant at f, which depends. I didn't name my constants for my quasi-asymmetric embedding, but let's call this a Kc quasi-asymmetric embedding. There's a constant depending. Uh, on the multiplicative quasi-isometry constant, um, such that uh, phi of Rn, so the image of this quasi-flat, um, this quasi-flat sitting in the space, is contained in a bounded neighborhood, uh, neighborhood of at most at most, uh, at most f flats. Okay, so it's a symmetric space, so there's actually isometrically embedded flats sitting in there, and now we've taken this kind of arbitrary quasi-asymmetric quasi embedding of Rn into that space, and this theorem says that it's contained inside um, a bounded neighborhood, of, a, a bounded neighborhood of, a, of a bounded number of flats. Okay, so that was their theorem. So they proved that um, because they wanted to sort of understand the geometry of symmetric spaces, I, yeah, as a consequence of this, they then proved that, uh, or so uh, Eskin Farr gave a new proof of this result uh, that of quasi asymmetric rigidity for lattices and higher rank symmetric spaces. Um, so, this is a very powerful theorem. Um, so, this theorem actually comes as a generalization already of something else, which is so I've saved this for n greater than or equal to 2. The history of this theorem goes back to, uh, to uh, cases of, of when n equals 1. So, in the rank 1 case, the first case where this was proven, was like in the 1920s, this is the Moss dilemma. So if you, in the 1920s, uh, Mo, uh, sorry, Moss dilemma. Morse. <laughs> Morse, right, the wrong M. So Morse proved that if you take. What? Is that before? Uh, I don't know. Uh, no. Thought it was the early 20s, but I could be wrong. Um, so uh, if you take uh, x equal to the hyperbolic plane, and you, uh, so we've got the hyperbolic plane here, and you have a quasi isometry of. Of, in this case, the rank is 1, so you have a quasi asymmetry of R into it, so that's called a, a quasi geodesic. Uh, then, then this theorem says that there exists, um, so the theorem he proved, right, is that there exists a geodesic. I would like to draw this in yellow, so it's a hyperbolic banana, but right, there's some geodesic here, and if you take a neighborhood of that geodesic, it looks like this hyperbolic banana, then the entire quasi geodesic is contained inside that. So, so in the case of rank 1, uh, when the hyperbolic plane, it turns out that f is equal to 1. There's a single uh, flat, in this case, a one-dimensional one flat, so it's a geodesic, so that the neighborhood of this quasi-geodesic is contained inside that. So that was, that was uh, Morse, 
And then in the 60s, Mostow, uh, Mostow proved the rank one case. Uh, and again, you get you get a single uh, you get a single you get a single geodesic there that the, that, uh, where a neighborhood of that contains your arbitrary quasi geodesic. Okay, so and, and that was used by Mostow to prove quasi rigidity rigidity um, for, for those symmetric spaces. So so the question is then so this is kind of a, a nice thing about symmetric spaces, um, but but how can we generalize this? So the question is uh, generalize. Okay, so. What other spaces or what other groups have um, have a quasi-flats theorem, a theorem where you can kind of understand the structure of all quasi-flats inside your space? Um, so one one case of that, which, which maybe we all care about, which I'll attribute to to Benson Farr, um, probably this was thought about by a lot of other people at the same time. Um, uh, Minsky and and, uh, and Mazur also, I'm sure, were thinking about this and others. Um, so the conjecture of Farr was that was that the mapping class group of a surface of finite type uh, satisfies a quasi-flat theorem. Satisfies a quasi-flat theorem. <coughs> okay, and um, so what I want to do so maybe, maybe the first thing to say is that is that uh, this conjecture is non-trivial for, for several reasons. The first of which is um, even making sense of the conjecture takes some work because um, we're no longer in a, something like a symmetric space where there's a natural version of what flats are, right? So there's no isometrically embedded, uh, th there's no natural isometrically embedded copies of Rn because uh, when we care about the quasi-isometric geometry of the mapping class group, we, right, we only know the geometry up to changing the generating sets, which only tells us things up to quasi-isometry. So already kind of getting the, the right definition of what the flats are uh, takes some work. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that's worth saying. Uh, another, another comment is, is uh, in the mapping class group, uh, there exists, there exists uh, quasi-flats, quasi-flats not near, not close to any single flat. Okay, so uh, well, any single flat. So, so what, what might we mean by flat? So, the, so the um, you know the first thing you might think of is, is we know that we can take uh, if we take a maximal set of Dane twist that gives us a, um, a free abelian subgroup of the mapping class group. You know it's an old result of Berman, uh, Blavatsky, and McCarthy that, that the rank of that is known. It's, it's the complexity of the surface three times the genus uh, plus the number of punctures minus three. Um, it's a theorem of, of Minsky and I that, that that's the maximal dimension of a quasi-flat inside, uh, inside the mapping class group. And so, uh, so you might ask, well, maybe every quasi-flat is contained inside a dating twist flat. Maybe those are the only ones. Um, but you can build examples. So, uh, so if we take like the five-volt sphere, take a sphere with five punctures, uh, so we can draw a sequence of curves on it. And make use of all the codes here. Um, or, oops, the color. Oh, yellow. Perfect. Right. So, um, so we can draw some curves. I'll draw the same curves that Kazer drew. This is what you learned, I guess, at Stony Brook. Uh, <laughs> so, ah, uh, wrong curve. So somebody learned it right, but. but <laughs> So this one, and then um, one knows what I'm going to draw except me. So the green one, blue one, and then one more in red, which is right here. Okay, good. So I got it right. Um, so you draw the five curves on the five-fold sphere, and then well, you notice you know the blue one and the red one are disjoint, so they kind of span some. If you look at their Dane twist, uh, if you look at Dane twist along them. They span some some you know some quadrants uh, in R two, and then you could take the red one and the yellow one, and they also span a quadrant. Okay, and then the yellow one and the purple one, <coughs> and they span a quadrant, and then the purple one and the green one span a quadrant, and then actually the the green one and the blue one then span a quadrant. So here I've got five quadrants all glued around the origin. Um, so there's a, actually a quasi-isometrically embedded copy of R two. 
uh, but it's not close to any single one of these flags. Okay, so there's sort of a, a potential, um, it's not an obstruction to, to proving this theorem because maybe f here is 5, uh, but it's an it's a, it's obstruction to proving it with f equals 1. So, um, so there exists quasi flats not close to any single flat. Um, so nonetheless, there's been some other there's been some other kind of partial progress on this. Like there's a theorem of, of Eskin, Mazur, and Rafi, where they prove that um, that sort of you know large parts of quasi flats lie like you know sublinearly away from standard flats. So there's kind of there's been some other kind of local approximation, uh, some sort of local versions of uh, that lead towards this conjecture, but but this conjecture hadn't been resolved yet. So what I want to do in this talk is to sort of establish a general framework where you can kind of ask this question and and then show that and then uh, give a positive resolution of that uh, for the for the mapping class group and for these other high kind of groups um, and and maybe even give a little glimpse of uh, part of the argument. Okay. So with that said, let me start by talking about hierarchically hyperbolic groups. I can start right hierarchically hyperbolic. Well, spaces. So, Hagen and Sisto and I um, kind of introduced these a few years ago. Um, and so, what I want to do is, is is explain kind of the basics of, of what they are. So, so, in general, you start with some space X, which is a quasi G uh, metric space. And maybe in parallel, I'll use this red chalk. And I'll explain. So, so the example to think about for us, obviously, is the mapping class group of a surface of finite type. Okay. So, so, uh, so every hierarchical hyperbolic space will have some quasi geometric space associated with it. Uh, we'll also associate uh, an index set. So, an index set. I'll say in a minute exactly what this is going to index. Um, so, in the case of the mapping class group, this is the set of <coughs> subsurfaces. Of S. So by subsurfaces, I mean <laughs> pi one injective, you know, non-trivial pi one injective subsurfaces considered up to up to isotopy. Um, so that's going to be my index set. Okay. And then uh, what's it going to index? Well, it's going to index a collection of which I'll call uh, C of uh, C of W. Um, so where W ranges over over the index. And what are these spaces? These are each. Uh, these are each. Delta, they're each uh, delta hyperbolic uh, G metric metric spaces. Is the delta uniform for all of them? Uh, the delta is uniform for all of them. Um, okay, so in the, 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 um, the, in the case of the mapping class group, what do we want? Well, I'll use the exact same notation and I'll call them CSC, <laughs> right? And then we'll know what we mean because we're talking the mapping class group. These are the curved complexes. The curve complex of W <laughs> associated with the subsurface. So, um, right, those were introduced by Harvey and then studied uh, extensively by Mazur and Minsky, where they proved that these are always delta hyperbolic. Okay, and, and we want, um, right, in general, we want our hyperbolic spaces to be geodesic, not just quasi geodesic. But you can, um, well, if that's the case for the curve complex, and or maybe I should say curve graph. Um, used to be curve complex, now we're going to talk about the curve graph. But, anyways, that's. Uh, um, Things. Okay, so um, so th so that's the kind of that's the main information. Those are kind of the three objects, and then and then the rest of it consists of kind of relations between these objects. So relations between the indices and and between the um, maps between the various associated spaces. So so the first um, let's see the first of these I want to say is uh, S. So my index set has a partial order. Okay, which we call nesting. And we usually denote by a square subset sign. Um, so there, there's a partial order called nesting, and in the property of that partial, one, one property of that partial order is uh, there exists a maximal element, and chains are bounded. Chains are bounded. Okay. In the case of the mapping class group. Um, the partial order is just uh, subsurface inclusion. Okay, so nesting is subsurface inclusion. Okay, so um, so the maximal element 
element is obviously just the full subsurface S, kind of the big subsurface. Um, everything else is nested inside that. And since you decrease complexity each time, but the ch chains are done. Okay, so that's the, that's the first kind of relation between elements in the index set. And the other important relation is, um, so S has an anti-reflexive symmetric relation we call orthogonality. Okay, and we denote by the perpendicular orthogonality sign. Um, and the property here is that there's there's a max there's a max to the number of simultaneously pairwise orthogonal sets. Um, so um, right, so there exists a, a bound on the size of a pairwise orthogonal sets. Okay, in the in in, in the mapping class group, this is just uh, so orthogonality is. Uh, disjointness. Okay, uh, it's disjointness, and, and we all know the bound on the size. So the bound is is the complexity of the surface S. This is just again three times the genus plus the number of punctures minus two. <clears throat> okay, so those are kind of the two general relations between the index sets uh, between elements in the index set, and then. Um, there's a few other things. Let me name one more. So, um, so there are, there exists, uh, there exists uh, coarsely Lipschitz um, Lipschitz maps. Uh, <coughs> let's see, I'll go over like this. Let's do like this. Pi sub x, which map x to uh, to the associated hyperbolic space, um, sorry, pi sub w, which map x to the hyperbolic space associated with w. Here, w ranges over my index set. Okay, and these are just the subsurface projections. Um, the, I guess, maybe since you guys are both in the audience, I'll say the Mazur Minsky <laughs> subsurface projections. Okay, so um, so I guess really it's, it's two subsets of, of, of C of W, but it's bounded by other subsets. Okay, so um, so that's the general setup. So there's there's a few there's um, if I was going to tell you everything, I'd say a few more things involving um, you know depending on whether or not pairs of indices are um, are nested or orthogonal or satisfy neither one of those. There's some there's some conditions on how those projections relate to each other. So there's relations between the projections. Um, <coughs> There's also an analog in the definition of, of the bounded GS of image theorem um, and, the, and the large link lemma, but, but I, I won't get into that now. It won't, uh, it won't make a difference. All right, so here's the board down. Um, okay, so, so that's kind of the, a summary of what the general setup is. And then, so let me then say, here's a few theorems uh, from the mapping cross world, which we generalized to this setting. Um, which we'll then talk about a, a bit more in, in uh, improving the quality class theorem. So, so one theorem is there's a distance formula. Okay, so um, so in general, there's a theorem. That's, so 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 what happens is for every pair of points a, b, and x, the distance in x between a and b is you know, uniformly quasi-asymmetrically estimated by summing over uh, all the elements in the index set. <coughs> and for each one, you look at the distance in the associated hyperbolic space between the projection to W of A and the projection to W of B. Um, and then just like in the mapping class group setting, then you kind of, you have to do some thresholding. So you can't count all of them, you need to throw away all the ones that are less than some given threshold. So in the case of the mapping class group, this is the famous Mazur-Minsky distance formula. Minsky distance formula. Okay, but we prove it, we, we, give, we give a proof that this holds sort of in the general context, so it gives a new proof in the mapping class group case. Um, 
and improves it for all the other higher than hyperbolic spaces, of which I'll give some examples in a few minutes. So, so that's uh, one uh, that's one theorem that's, that's going to be relevant for us. Another theorem is we'll call um, hierarchy has exists. Okay, so I haven't told you what a hierarchy path is, but I'm going to tell you as part of this statement. Um, so it's a little bit, so it's more general than what they are in the mapping class group setting. So for every pair of points, x and y, or maybe I should say a, b, in x, there exists a, unif there exists a uniform quality quasi-geodesic connecting them. Uh, so there exists a uniform uh, quality quasi-geodesic. Gamma connecting them, connecting A and B, uh, with the property that uh, for each element of the index set, uh, we have that the projection <coughs> to W of gamma is an unparametrized quasi is an unparametrized. Because it, it may slow down for a long time and then, and then proceed, but, but sort of as a, as a subset, it's a, so it's an unparametrized quasi g essay. It can be reparametrized. Okay. So, um, so again, in the mapping class group setting, this is, uh, this is sort of part of Major Minsky. Um, so they have, in, in their context, hierarchy paths. Uh, are a more restricted family quasi but they have this property. So this is kind of a slightly more general property. Um, so we can construct path, we can construct a family of paths like this in any higher than hyperbolic space, and we'll make use of those uh, later. Okay, so that's sort of the general setup. Um, so so far, I've only told you things that we already know about mapping class groups. So let me tell you some other examples. So uh, so examples of hyperbolic spaces. So, well, the example I just did is the mapping class group of the surface. Um, okay, but what are the new examples? Well, so the first one, the one that we were, the one that got us started, uh, was writing a large groups. Okay, so, um, so I don't want to go through the examples in detail, but maybe let me just say a few things about the writing a large group example. So, so what's a writing a large group? Right, this is a sub gamma, so gamma is a graph, and the right order group associated to that graph has, um, has a generator, has an infinite order generator for every vertex of gamma, and then it's got a commutation relation for every, uh, for every edge in that graph. So, so that gives you a, okay, that, so that gives you a, um, a finally presented a group uh, associated to gamma. So that's what A of gamma is. Um, so, so that's so the space is then the Cayley graph associated to that group. Um, so what's the what's the set of subsurfaces? So in this case, uh, so S is equal to the set of so it's uh, so it's going to be left cosets of A of uh, A of of A of lambda. Okay, where so here so lambda is a subset uh, subset or equal to uh, the whole group, uh, the whole graph. So, so lambda is a subset of gamma, and G is an element of A of gamma. So, it's a left coset of one of these um, of one of these special subgroups, and and it's it's this is almost the index set. It's this considered up to um, some equivalence, and the equivalence is is parallelism. So, um, so two cosets are parallel. <coughs> If uh, they are a, a finite, if they are a bounded Hausdorff distance apart, so if they are a finite Hausdorff distance distance apart. Okay, so those are um, that's our index set. Um, there's then the hyperbolic spaces. So the hyperbolic spaces um, are what are called contact graphs. So one. Uh, so, so these are something that, that Mark Hagen introduced in his thesis. Um, there are delta hyperbolic spaces. Uh, the way you can build them is the, there's a vertex for every hyperplane 
inside. So if you're a cat cube complex, there's the vertex for every hyperplane in the cat cube complex. And two of them are connected by an edge if they can't be separated by a third hyperplane. Um, so so I, I don't want to put the details of that, but I wanted to say that. Um, so here's, here's uh, so, so that gives you the structure. And let me just say then, so what is, um, so nesting is just, uh, so two things are nested if, if, um, if they correspond to the same subgraph and one's included into the other. So this is going to be kind of subgraph inclusion and orthogonality corresponds to uh, look at, so you look at the subsets um, inside your Cat cube complex and you care about whether they span a plane. So this, so, so this corresponds to spanning a plane, or sorry, spanning a, a product uh, in, uh, so in the, in the associated Cat cube complex, so in the sub eddy complex. Okay, so there, there's some kind of, there's a Cat cube complex associated with this universal cover, and two things are going to be um, orthogonal if they span a, if they span a product. Okay, so and that's sort of similar to the mapping class group setting because you want you know you want you want things that are orthogonal to span direct products, uh, um, or at least quasi asymmetric things like quasi asymmetric to direct products inside the <coughs> space. Okay, so that's uh, the second example. So what else? So it turns out that's a special case of something more general. Let me just say um, many. Cat zero cube complexes, cat zero cube complexes. So um, with Hagen and Sisto, we proved that if you take the universal cover of a special of a special uh, cube complex, a uh, special cat zero cube complex, special in the sense of, of Hagen wise, uh, then that has a high compared block structure. And then um, there's a generalization of that due to Hagen and Hagen and Seuss, where they kind of weaken specialness to some kind of um, uh, Finite height type properties. So, so I'll just say many Cassio cube complexes have this property. In particular, um, in particular, uh, I already said rags, um, but let me just also add right angle cocktail groups. Okay, so um, so that's a bunch of groups already. A few others. Um, so let me say some spaces. Right. So some spaces are uh, type Mueller space. Type Mueller space. Uh, with either the W, so so actually, so this definition is quite a symmetric invariant. So we prove this is true for either the WP metric, um, <coughs> metric, or the type Miller metric. Um, but then, like, you know, these, there's theorems of, of Sun and Yao, uh, I guess Lu Sun Yao, that, that sort of essentially all the known metrics that people care about in type space are QI to one of those. So. So that really covers almost all known metrics on type Miller space. Um, what else? Uh, pi one of a three manifold. Uh, so not all three manifolds, but any three manifold uh, with uh, with no nil or solve component. Those ones are not hyperbolic. Um, for and then maybe just to say a few more examples, um, or maybe one more example. So, um, so the separating curve graph, um, separating curve graph. So this is by uh, Katie Vokes. So this is a 2018 Ward PhD. Um, yeah, do you have questions? Okay. All right. So, um, so okay, that's enough for now. But but there's. There's other examples. There's combination theorems and other ways to build things. Um, uh, right. David S. Spiro has, has, some, uh, has some other constructions, and there's, there's many other ways to do this. So, OK, uh, I've got one more board over there. So these are the examples. Um, let me just say a few. There's a few non-examples, too. OK, so. Uh, so out of n, well, as long as n is bigger than bigger than two, so than two, <laughs> uh, out f n except for n equals two. Um, so that's a non-example, and, and the reason is right. So there's a more general obstruction, which is um, uh, so any uh, you know any su any super quadratic gain function. 
any group with a any group with a super quadratic Dane function. So so Brian Bowditch proved that um, that coarse median spaces have have most quadratic Dane function. Um, so any higher parabolic space turns out to be coarse median, and so it follows that that they have the most of quadratic Dane function, and that rules out out of n for n bigger than two. Okay, so that those are the that's the general way we know to build counterexamples. Um, okay, so what I want to do now is turn to um, so before I before I get to exactly what, what our theorem is, uh, let me state um, let me state a theorem that's sort of a closer model to, to what it is that we want to prove. So um, so here's a theorem of of Huang of Jin Ying Huang. So what did he prove? So he was interested in the class of, um, of Cat of zero spaces, Cat zero groups and Cat zero spaces, and he proved uh, let X be an n-dimensional cat uh, zero cube complex. Uh, sorry, yeah, cat zero cube complex. Um, so x is a cat zero cube complex, um, and let f be an n-dimensional quasi-flat uh, in x. Okay, so, so you have an n-dimensional cat zero cube complex, and then you have a quasi-flat of the same dimension as the ambient space. Okay, so then he proved, uh, then there exists cubical orthens. Okay, so a cubical orthen is just a copy of you know, r to the, in this case, r to the n plus with a standard cubing. Uh, so let me rewrite it. Go to infinity to the n with the standard cubing. Okay, which is exactly what you think it would be. Um, so there exists cubic orthens O1, O1 to OK. Um, right, so the, right, for which, uh, for which the Hausdorff distance between F and the union of these of these K orthens um, is bounded. Okay, so um, so there's some number K so that you can take K orthens, um, uh, and, and, you know, for most K orthens, and and your space F is is how sort of close to that union of the spaces. Okay, so this is K independent of F or is so right, K is independent of F. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, no. Well, orthens on the nose. Um, orthens. There, there's orthens. It depends on the. Quality. Sorry, it, it depends on it depends on the quality of the constants. Yeah. Oh, I see. Sorry, it depends. Yeah. Right. So K K depends on this constant which I left off. Um, okay. So. <coughs> So this theorem actually general was so this generalizes the theorem of, of Vesfina, Kleiner, and Segev, where they did the two-dimensional case of this. Um, uh, and so what so what does this give you? So this gives you a theorem about uh, about general cat zero cube complexes, but there's a strong assumption which is the quasi flat has to be the same dimension of the cube complex. So so um, so here's a remark, right? So this doesn't apply. For instance, if you take the real line and you add on one little innocuous cube, then all of a sudden this doesn't work because because the direct the, you know this has uh, the the largest size of quasi flat is rank one, whereas this has two dimensional cubes. So it doesn't apply here. And more generally, um, so more generally, this doesn't apply uh, to many right angle coxeter groups. Or to, to yeah, let's say many. Right angle coxeter groups, because for instance, right, you can you, you take a right angle coxeter group that's a that's a cycle, then that's virtually a surface group. So that gives you like a cumulation of a surface group, uh, but a surface has at most one dimensional quasi flats, but this is a two dimensional complex. So um, so this and you can you can do higher you can do higher dimensional things. You can build higher dimensional hyperbolic groups and, and, and more complicated higher dimensional things, uh, but this doesn't apply. So <coughs> this is a great theorem, uh, but it's sort of a strong hypothesis. So, um, so what our goal is is we actually 
Um, even though the mapping class group is not cat zero and it's definitely not a cat zero cube complex, um, we end up using this theorem uh, in order to in order to uh, um, to reach the mapping class group. So, so in order to say that, let me first say how we build orthos. So now we need the eraser. Okay, so what's the um, so so the first question to ask is what's the right version of an orthint in the general setting? So um, so let me just start with some examples of I'll call these product regions. And let me just start with some examples. Um, so the first example I'll take is in the mapping class group. So let's let you know U and V both be um, you know subsurfaces of S. Uh, well, so I guess as I wrote it. Let's write like this. So element of S with U orthogonal to V. Okay, and here X is equal to the mapping class group. Okay, so in other words, you have two disjoint subsurfaces in the mapping class group. Well, what do we know? So then it turns out, right, you could think about the associated subsurface stabilizer. I'll just be a little loose and I'll call it the mapping class group of U, but the mapping class group of U cross the mapping class group of V quasi-isometrically embeds. QI embeds into the mapping class group of X. Okay, so that's sort of an example of, of a product that you see in the, in the mapping that you see inside the mapping class group. So if you take disjoint things uh, in the mapping class group, then you get then those stabilizers um, at least at least uh, geometrically commute inside there. Um, so another example, so that's the first example, example zero, example one is what happens in the, like in the writing in the writing larger group setting. <coughs> so let's let um, so let's let x be equal to the Arden group associated to, to gamma. Um, and let's let lambda be a subgraph of gamma. Okay, in other words, so I could have just said it's an element of my uh, well, so I want just a subgraph of gamma. So then what can I do? Well then I can take um, I can take the Arden group associated to lambda, and I can then, so that commutes with anything that's distant, that, where everything is distance one from lambda. So A of, of lambda cross A of, I'll write the link of lambda, so inside the graph, all the vertices that are distance one from everything of lambda, that actually isometrically embeds, right? So this embeds isometrically, um, isometrically into, into A of gamma. Okay, so this is another example of, of a product region. So this is sort of a, this is a product sitting inside um, sitting inside an ambient uh, hierarchy hyperbolic space. So so what's the general idea? So the general idea. Um, so in general, we can consider um, consider element U V inside um, inside our index set, and we can associate. So we consider. <coughs> Uh, so some simpler hyperbolic spaces, so simpler hyperbolic spaces, simpler in terms of the complexity. Um, so one associate, uh, which I'll call, here maybe I'll call F of U and F of V. Uh, and, um, and we get, so F of U cross F of V, uh, QI embedded, into into X, um, and and let me say this. Let me say kind of what's relevant here. Um, so this has the property. So we get this uh, with the property property uh, that uh, the, the distance formula terms. Right. What do we know about the distance formula terms in this case? Every every subsurface that every subsurface that will appear in the distance formula will either be nested into U or nested into V. And so our general property is that we have these kind of we get these associated spaces, and this is the one where all the distance formula terms are nested inside U, and this is the one where all the distance formula terms are nested inside V. So in general, we get this product where everything is nested inside one of these facts. So U and V are supposed to be orthogonal. Uh, yeah, I should have said that. Consider U with U orthogonal to V. Thanks. All the distance terms are nested are nested 
in U or in V. <coughs> okay. Okay, so then the next question is, so now I've got these product regions, so I can use these, right, you, you see that you could take, right, in, in my examples I did it with, with two different uh, elements in the index set, but you could do it with, up to, you could do it with, uh, up to the complexity of, the, of x, number of, number of things that are, that are simultaneously permitted. <coughs> or you might be able to, uh, so, so you, yes, you might be able to find it, so you can find a collection of those and then you can get these products, so then, using that, then we can define, let's define orthens. So, um, so in orthens, in X, um, uh, 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 comes from, uh, is, well, comes, uh, is associated to, to a collection U1, to un, uh, to un, in my index set with with uh, the ui pairwise orthogonal, pairwise orthogonal. Um, so you take this pairwise orthogonal thing, you build this associated product region, and then what you do is you take um, a, so these are sub hyperbolic <coughs> So, um, and they're sort of sub hierarchical faces in a natural way. They've got the same index, they've got just a restricted index set. Um, and then what we can do is each one of those, we take our hierarchy path that, that we know exists in general. And so we now just take this product of these n hierarchy paths, and that's one of my standard orbits. Um, so with the UI pairwise, pairwise orthogonal, and then build, um, and build the, uh, the R, uh, R plus to the n uh, uh, by taking a uh, hierarchy or a hierarchy ray um, in, in each factor, in each in each of the associated factors associated with it, with with uh, with f with the f of the ui. Okay, so you've got a bunch of these f uis which are sub hierarchical spaces. You now take one hierarchy ray in each one of those. That gives me a uh, quasi-asymmetric embedding of Rn uh, into my of R, of, of, well, the sector in Rn into my space, and those are my standard orthens. Okay, and then let's let um, set uh, new equal to new of x equal to the max rank of a standard orthen. Of a, I guess I'm calling it orthens. Of an orthen in x. Okay, so uh, the max rank is at most the complexity, but but depending on some of these things may be finite. So th this may this may or may not be um, th this max rank may be strictly small. It may be at most the complexity, but it may be strictly smaller. So then our theorem. Uh, uh, is the following. So um, if so, x is an HHS. Uh, well, let me say. There's a there's a mild hypothesis, so let me say is a hierarchically hyperbolic group. Okay, so um, so there's a mild technical hypothesis. We can prove this for for most of the spaces with that hypothesis, but it works for any um, hierarchically hyperbolic group. So if X is a hierarchically hyperbolic group, um, then there exists uh, orthens. Oh, uh, sorry. Right. So it's a hierarchy of a group, and F uh, is a uh, quasi flat, is a KC quasi flat, um, who's a rank of rank nu of X, um, then. Uh, there exists, right? There exists this constant f, depending on k, uh, such that there exists this constant, and orthens 
uh, O1 up to OF such that, uh, sorry, I, I, I have two different Fs here. Sorry, I don't want two Fs. Let's call this N. I don't have another N. There's N. Right? N just depends on F. Uh, such that uh, the Hausdorff distance between uh, between F and the union of these um, of these of these finite number of orthons is bound. Okay, so um, so that theorem then works in the, in any higher hyperbolic group, and so in particular this works for the mapping class group. So this kind of resolves um, you know Farb's conjecture about the mapping class group. Uh, it works for the May Peterson metric, which that had been a conjecture of Jeff Brock's. Um, so, so right, there's a there's a slightly more general. So that spaces, we say spaces plus a hypothesis, which I'm not going to mention, but it's sort of a model hypothesis that works for the May Peterson metric. Uh, so it works there. It works for um, any special cube complex. So that sort of generalizes Swan's theorem because because you don't need to have this this dimension matching. Um, the dimension of the rank doesn't have to match the dimension of the space. Okay, so um, so that's this general setup, and uh, I wanted to say a little about proof, but I think I'm out of time, so maybe I should stop here. Um, so I think the answer is yes. I don't know off the top of my head, but, no. but yeah, yeah, that's right. So I, yeah, in fact, yes, I do know an answer, but I can't remember it right now. So I, yes, I mean, <laughs> right. At first, I was like, oh, maybe this is all this is all things with finite gain functions. Definitely not. Um, but if you ask me afterwards, maybe. What is that? Uh, that is. Yeah, well, that's no, 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 no. no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, no, it's, it, it's conjecture to be quadratic, but it's known to be quadratic. Aren't free by cyclic groups? Oh, no, no, it's going to be quadratic. Oh, just that's what you free yeah, 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 I think the, yeah, ma the mapping torus of a polynomial free group automorphism is quadratic Dane function, right? And it's probably not an HHG. So right. could you, sorry, could you say that louder? Your the, the mapping torus of a polynomially growing free group automorphism is, I, I think it has quadratic Dane function, but it's probably not an HHG. There's a simpler example that I know too that if I put it on the spot, I would know. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty long. Is there a one minute version of the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yes, yes, there is. Um, so, let, so let me say so, how do we, like, the mapping class group, right, in higher catabolic space, in general, aren't Katsuro cube complexes, so how can we use this theorem? So, the idea is that we show that, like, given any finite number of points, there's a way to build kind of an analog of a convex hole inside a higher parabolic space, and then we prove that those convex holes are Katsuro cube complexes, and we prove that they're Katsuro cube complexes of rank, you know, at most the complexity of the surface. And so, so sort of using that, then you kind of get these good, so, so even though the map group isn't Katsuro cube complex, it's kind of well approximated by Katsuro cube complexes, and then we can kind of factor through his theorem to, to generalize his theorem and to prove it in these kind of, you know, much more general spaces. Is that how we avoid these next week's extraneous cubes? Yeah, that's how we extraneous cubes. Yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, so we get these kind of good approximations of the range. Any more questions?